Hello, Calculus students. Here's a run-through of the solution of free response, Unit 5, Set A. There's one question here. Alrighty, and this is a calculator question. So have your calcula calculator handy, or you ran through this already, and you can kind of see uh, what your response should have looked like. Let some function f be a twice differentiable function, such that f prime of 1 is equal to 0. That tells us something if the derivative at a certain point is equal to 0. Remember that. The second derivative of this function is given by this function f double prime of x is equal to x squared uh, times cosine of x squared plus pi on that interval from negative 1 to 3. Alrighty, let's look at part a. Part a is a two-point portion of this question. On what open intervals contained in negative 1 to 3 is the graph of our function f concave up? Think for a second. You know when a function is concave up by looking at its second derivative. And if the second derivative is positive, then your function is concave up. Alrighty. So for part a, I might say something like on the interval negative 1 to 3, the graph of f is concave up on, let's find some interval. So we have to see where the second derivative is positive. Alrighty, as long as this is a graphing calculator question, I plugged the second derivative into y1. So the function for my second derivative was x squared times cosine of x squared plus pi. And I really just want to see on my window. So I adjusted my window. I want to see on this interval. So I set my x min to equal negative 2 and my x max to equal 4, just so I could clearly see that interval. Alrighty, let me pause and sketch my graph. If you want to plug that into your calculator to look at it, let me pause. Okay, forgive my rough sketch, but it looked something like this, kind of flattened out here around zero. But my function looked something like this. And we told ourselves that my function is concave up when the second derivative is positive above zero. So that's over here. The second derivative is positive over here and over here. Alrighty, so then I calculated those zeros. There's three of them. And I see where that function is above uh, the x-axis. And I calculated those zeros to be approximately 1.253 to 2.171 were those zeros. And from 2.802, that was that third zero over here, x-intercept, and we were only asked on this interval from negative 1 to 3, so I'm going to stop that at 3. And it did ask for open intervals. Okay, so between negative 1 and 3, the graph of f is concave up on first interval and the second interval. Give us a reason, because f double prime of x is positive on those intervals. Let me see where our points came from. You can probably guess. Uh, you get a point for these intervals. And you get a point for this explanation. Alrighty. I would probably show something just so the graders can see what I did, what I plugged into my calculator. Uh, but those were where your two points came from. And this would be some justification. Alrighty, read carefully part B. Okay, part B is also two points. Does our function f have a relative min, a relative max, or neither one at x equals 1, and justify your answer? Okay, so I'll start off at x is equal to 1. We can come back here and use this important information. f prime of 1 is equal to 0. Remember, if the derivative is equal to 0, that was one condition to have a critical number. Remember that from class? And if the derivative is equal to 0, that implies a horizontal tangent line. So in my mind, my function either looks like this at x equals 1 or like this because I have a horizontal tangent at x equals 1. Alrighty, so at x equals 1, 
f prime of 1 is equal to 0. And I'm going to notice this and refresh your memory. f double prime of 1. You can actually calculate that value on your graph. If you go to your graph, either look at your graph at x equals 1 or calculate that value at x equals 1. And please notice that the second derivative is negative. Alrighty, so you can find that value. They did provide the value. That f double prime of 1, which is approximately negative 0 0.540. Key thing there is negative, is less than 0. So, what were we asked to find? Oh, relative max met, or relative min. I'm sorry. Uh, so let's see. The first derivative is 0. Second derivative is negative. So the function f is concave. What did that tell you? If the second derivative is negative, the function is concave down. So in my mind, I'm thinking I have a horizontal tangent and I have a function that's concave down. Looks like this. And now I've already convinced myself that I have a relative maximum. Alrighty, uh, AP quoted this. If the first derivative is 0, second derivative is negative, by the second derivative test. That's what this told us. By the second derivative test which we used, first derivative is 0, second derivative is negative, by the second derivative test, f has a relative maximum at x equals 1. This is good thinking, but you are given a point for that explanation. So let's see, a two-point portion of this problem and one point for being correct. Another point, though, for giving given some justification. So good justification is all of this. Okay, so I have a clear reason for why you're saying there's a relative maximum. Okay, thanks for watching because we do refresh our memory on many things. Don't be discouraged if they were tough the first time through, but learn something as you work through. Okay, part C, <laughs> speaking of which, part C is tough. Okay, this one, um, <laughs> this one is a stretch. So let's read carefully and how refresh our memory on the mean value theorem. Okay, three points for this portion, part C. Let's refresh our memory on the mean value theorem. Mean value theorem applies for a continuous function. There always exists a value C between A and B such that the derivative at C f prime of c is equal to the slope of the secant line connecting a and b. So if I find the slope between a and b, there's got to be a c value in between that has that same slope. So f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a all over b minus a for a continuous function. Okay, so that's where this comes into play. Since f is twice differentiable, the uh, function is continuous, the derivative is continuous, uh, so let's see. Since f is twice differentiable, we can actually use, we can use the mean value theorem on the first derivative. So it's going to look a little bit different. Again, this one is tricky. It's going to look a little different than this. I'm actually going to use the mean value theorem on the first derivative. And I'm going to say, okay, so the question is, show that f prime of negative 1 cannot possibly equal 2.5. If f prime of negative 1 equals 2.5, then f prime of, what do I want, f prime of, what am I using? <laughs> Since f is twice differentiable, we can use the mean value theorem on the first derivative. Okay, and I want on the interval from negative 1 to 1. 
So negative 1 to 1 are those endpoints A and B. If f prime of negative 1 were 2.5, then f prime of 1, first endpoint, minus f prime of negative 1, other endpoint, all over 1 minus negative 1. Okay, so that's finding the slope of the secant line using the first derivative would equal, what is f prime of 1? That was given to us, f prime of 1 is 0, minus, if f prime of negative 1 is 2.5, divided by 2, I get negative 1.25. Okay, so using the first derivative, which is a continuous function, I can find the secant slope, which is negative 1.25. Alrighty, uh, let's see. Alright, so I'm going to quote the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem would guarantee a value c on that interval from negative 1 to 1 such that the second derivative at c would equal negative 1.25. Okay, so this is that slope of the first derivative. This is the value of that second derivative. Now I'm going to show that the second derivative, there is no c value that gives me a value of negative 1.25. However, if the second derivative of x is defi defined to be x squared times cosine of x squared plus pi, look at this coefficient. On the interval from negative 1 to 1, x squared is always less than or equal to what? On this interval of x values, x squared, that coefficient of cosine, the biggest I'll get is 1 squared, which is 1. Smallest I'll get is negative 1 squared, which is still 1. And x squared is always less than or equal to 1. Think of this as an amplitude. Okay, so now the amplitude of that cosine function, the max it can be is 1. We know that cosine itself is always between negative 1 and 1. So if f, if f double prime is defined to be this on that interval, then negative 1 is less than or equal to f double prime of x is less than or equal to 1. These function values are bound between negative 1 and 1. This implies there is no such c to give f double prime of c equal to negative 1.25. If the smallest it can be is negative 1, certainly can't be negative 1.25. All right, take a moment, kind of read through. It's a little tricky. Might have to come back to that one. All righty, let's look at that last uh, case, part D. Take a moment and read. Okay, this part should be refreshing now. Does the graph of f have a point of inflection at x equals 0? When did we have a point of inflection? Whenever we had a change in concavity. Okay, to have a point of inflection, you need a change in concavity. I actually went back to my graph. Here's my graph of the second derivative. Notice at negative 0, I'm sorry, at x equals 0, that function continues negative. It stays below the axes, and f double prime is negative in that interval around 0. Since there's no change in sign, there is no change in concavity. So I'm going to say no, since f double prime of x does not change sign, does not change sign at x equals 0. For our purposes, that meant there was no change in concavity, if you remember. AP did not require that. Since f double prime does not change sign at x equals 0, the graph, be careful, go back to the graph function f, the graph of f does not, because we're analyzing the function, does not have a point of inflection at x equals 0. Okay, thanks for watching and learn from your mistakes. Alrighty, you have a great day.